me thank everybody for coming and welcome Shirley Lynn. It's a pleasure to welcome Shirley because she's one of the few people in this field who kind of has followed a similar path to me. So she spent really her, the early part of, not the early part, but good part of her life at Goldman Sachs, ultimately running uh, private equity there. I tried to hire her but failed, um, which was a deep sadness for Carlisle and my various partners. Um, but she has now transitioned into being an academic and an author. And the book, which is outside, if you would like it, and the author is here to autograph it, if you want that, Thank you. Um, is Taiwan's China Dilemma, which is really a focus on what the two of us looked at for many years, which is cross-strait economic policy and how um, the national identity of Taiwan affects that policy. And it really, it's a very thorough analysis of how that policy has oscillated over the last 20-something years. Um, but Shirley's going to talk for about a half hour. Yep. And then I'll ask her some questions. And then you can ask her some questions. But welcome. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. And uh, thank you to um, everybody at the um, National Committee. And uh, Steve is an old friend, as, uh, and as, as Steve said, a uh, few people in, uh, in our old job <laughs> tread this path, uh, which, of course, I found out very soon after uh, leaving the Goldman Partnership that it was much harder uh, to write a book and then to, uh, to do anything else I had done before. Uh, but it's, uh, it's been such a pleasure because while I was on Wall Street, uh, one of the questions that I asked all the time was, while the Chinese market was so attractive and I was spending all of my time in mainland China, uh, I really uh, didn't understand why Taiwan's policy toward China was so inconsistent. At times, very much um, restrictive and at other times, uh, liberalizing. And this alternated between the two parties, uh, whether they were green or blue. Uh, and it was so fascinating to me that I decided to look into it, thinking that, it, of course, it could be explained by economic factors alone. Uh, at initially, uh, before I um, completed the research, I was focusing only on economic data that talked about perhaps losers of globalization who are not benefiting from all this interdependence with China. But um, after three years, actually, of collecting data, I realized I was on the wrong path because I wasn't able to explain anything with the data that I had. And it turned out that I think most of the conversations I had with leading um, opinion makers um, uh, in Taiwan, whether they were in business, students, or in non-government organization, uh, was that their sense of identity was actually um, the most important reason for why they support a certain kind of economic policy. So um, just to start uh, with the background, of course, the reason of this is a very important issue for the world is while Beijing regards Taiwan as Chinese, people in Taiwan are consolidating a separate identity, uh, especially uh, with more economic interdependence. And as Taiwan experiences the uneven socioeconomic consequences of globalization, um, Taiwanese are also weighing the cost of deeper integration with China. And so uh, it comes to Taiwan's China dilemma, whether Taiwan should deepen its interdependence with uh, China to strengthen its position um, globally, or it should uh, try to protect its autonomy uh, by reducing the dependence on the Chinese economy. Now, um, while this is happening, the younger generation have developed an even stronger sense of Taiwanese identity and this trend, of course, is alarming for Beijing, which wants to deepen Taiwan's political and economic integration with the mainland in order to secure unification. Now, um, you can see here from 1990 to 2014, to give you a uh, uh, simple perspective, um, at the beginning of the study in 1990, 1990 is the beginning of the study because that's when Taiwan started to regulate investments uh, and trade with China. Um, but, uh, of course, uh, Taiwan then was, uh, China was about more than uh, twice that of Taiwan's GDP. Um, and, uh, and Taiwan also had a lot of technology and know-how that China very much needed. But by 2014, and I should say by 2016 today, what is the situation? Well, the ratio is 18 to 1, but that's not as important as another figure I would tell you, which is Taiwan today is simply the province of Guangdong, that's all. 
So it is now much smaller uh, in relative terms. More importantly, uh, Taiwan's trade with China has grown. And um, the trade that has grown, you see over the years, is regardless of whether it's the Democratic Pro Progressive Party or the KMT. Um, and it started from 1990. It actually grew the most during Chen Shui-bian's era in terms of percentage. And then, and after 2008, Ma Ying-jeou came into, the, from the Nationalist Party, came back to power. And for the late next eight years, uh, there was increasing bilateral agreement um, uh, toward a liberalizing trade and investment. Um, but what you don't see here is the trade surplus number. In fact, in, as of 2015 year end, Taiwan's trade surplus that it enjoys with China has reached a 10 year low. So while trade has grown, uh, the benefits have been uneven, at times better than others. Um, and uh, recently, perhaps it's related to China's own slowdown economically. What, what t two questions back is is one is it's the size of Guangdong. What would that put it in the world? What would that put it in the world? Well, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, in terms of per capita, I know the countries will a lot, a lot better, but Taiwan is not insignificant. I mean, Guangdong is a, is a it's similar to several European countries. Right. Um, uh, what was the second question, Steve? This, what was the trade surplus? You said it was a 27 low. 27 billion. 27 billion, yes. which is still. Which is a 10 year low. Yes, but of course, uh, the relative term is very important because Ma had come into power um, uh, promoting economic liberalization as the solution to many of Taiwan's problems, um, that it is really more problematic of a society that's trying to upgrade its um, economy. And, uh, and so I think this is the bigger issue that over the eight years that he was in power, the economic liberalization didn't seem to benefit most of the ordinary folks. And this is the question that I'll come to later on. Because the question that you would need to answer is that as a result of economic factors totally unrelated to the trade liberalization, and it would have been much worse had his well, policies not been in effect. In other words, to say that it yeah. didn't grow, well, China's economy has been steadily slowing over that period. Right. I think, Steve, the more important question, which is also uh, what my study is focused on, is what is the effect of all of this on the Taiwanese society? And because this is what Beijing, of course, wants to see. Beijing has given a lot of benefits to Taiwan under the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, but the purpose of it was to promote a greater sense of Chinese identity and a more desire for unification. So let's look at why that hasn't been the case. Um, the second slide here on the economic data is foreign direct investment. So Taiwan, unlike other countries, um, in, uh, in sort of uh, increasing its, um, intensifying its economic interdependence with China, is very focused on investment. So most of the trade that happens between Taiwan and China is focused on Taiwanese businesses investing in China, and therefore they're producing uh, for export. And so you will see that Taiwan, as of 1990 to 2014, the dark area is uh, foreign direct investment that Taiwan um, puts out to the world, invests outward, and the top line, sorry, the top line is the world, and the dark line is China. So you can see China is basically two-thirds of all of Taiwan's outward uh, foreign direct investment. Now this is very important because um, uh, it means that Taiwan's dependence on China or interdependence uh, with China cannot uh, change overnight. It's uh, based on long-term uh, investments. So, so we're the, the committee on November fourteenth is putting out a report on, on U.S. investment in China and Chinese investment in the United States and doing a comparison of that. So, um, where is this data? So, I'm very interested because the, the conclusion I'm not the conclusion of this report is going to be that the data significantly understates the amount of investment, that both Chinese investment in the United States is understated and, and U.S. investment in China is vastly understated. So where does this data come from? Um, well, if you don't mind, actually, Steve, I'm going to stand up. It's hard for me to see my own slide. Um, well, the, the data here is, I think, even more distorted than what Steve is talking about between U.S. and China, because Taiwanese traditionally have not wanted to invest um, 
in China all officially because they need to go through so much regulation, which is what I will talk about um, in the next few slides. And so you can see here, cumulative investment in China is about 150 billion. But if you look at what goes through uh, BVI, Hong Kong, and many other third um, right. party locations, it's much greater Which is than exactly, that. U.S. companies do the do same. The same. So, right. and, the, and the governments just count what goes directly, which is quite small. Right. Um, now, all of that is interesting only because of what's happening at the same time. And this is what I was talking about in terms of my research leading me down to a different path. While all of this was happening, the expectation um, for most people in the world, including the Taiwanese themselves, was that Taiwanese would become more and more inclined to identify themselves as Chinese. And this is very important because this is 1992. Um, that's when the data started with the most reliable um, uh, data set that we have from National Jinju University's Election Study Center. But what I should tell you is in 1989, right after Taiwan democratized, the number actually of Taiwanese who thought they were Chinese and nothing but Chinese was 52%. I just want to put that into perspective because uh, uh, um, I want to thank Harry, uh, my other half, who's long been associated with the National Committee. So he and I have uh, been uh, on an identity tour since I completed the book. And the identity tour that took us to the Middle East, several countries in Eastern Europe, um, uh, and the Baltic state. And you can see that very few countries change their sense of identity in 30 years. And this is what's happened in Taiwan. So this is a very interesting question. Um, by 1992, you can still see that those who claim that they are Chinese, which is the bottom line, is well over a quarter for several years in the early 1990s. Um, and even though the top line says, broadly speaking, Taiwanese, meaning both those who claim they're Taiwanese and those who claim they're Taiwanese and Chinese, that's over 60%. But a large part of that was those who thought they were both Chinese and Taiwanese. And only less than 20% um, was those who thought they were Taiwanese. Today, it's totally changed. As of 2016, um, uh, as of just two months ago, actually, 93% uh, of Taiwanese think they're Taiwanese, or both Taiwanese and Chinese. And of that 93%, two thirds of them think they're only Taiwanese. And more importantly, for young people, it is double that of older generation. So the younger they are, the more inclined they are to not say they are Chinese. And the reason I manipulated the data, which is a three-way data, into two lines is because the bottom line is what Beijing wants to look at. Beijing only wants to look at this line because that is going to assure them some um, sense that unification um, could be achieved. The second way that Taiwanese measure identity is what we call prefer na future national status. Um, and this is similar now to actually um, uh, some of what you'll see in terms of studies in Hong Kong uh, because uh, of the future status being uh, uncertain. Now in Taiwan, it, this study started in 1994. You can see that basically more than uh, one fifth of Taiwanese thought they wanted unification. And again, the reason I changed the seven way data to two lines is because the bottom line is again what Beijing wants to see. And the bottom line has dropped from 20% to 10% for those who want to see unification as soon as possible and those who want to see unification eventually. Now, um, more alarming than the 20% dropping to 10% is for those who say that they are interested in unification as soon as possible has dropped uh, to uh, only a little bit above 1% the last two years. Um, so very few people want to see that uh, happening. Although uh, in terms of percentage of people who claim they are only Chinese today um, is 3.5%, a little bit higher, but still uh, terribly low. So what is happening in the background and uh, um, what does it mean to have a Taiwanese identity? Um, this really required a lot of investigation because uh, Taiwanese are really ethnically, 98% of Taiwanese are Han Chinese, same as Chinese. So to say there's an ethnic divide is very, very unclear. Now, after democratization, Taiwanese identity was initially also ethnically divided. The ethnic divide was artificial. It was basically those who came with the Chiang Kai-shek government in 1949 were called Wai Shenren, people from out of province. People who lived in Taiwan before that uh, were called Ben Shenren. So it was a divide that was put on your ID card in school system. And um, uh, after democratization, the taboo of not talking about this became lifted and everyone was focused on ethnic divide, like most other emerging democracies um, also went through. 
But as economic integration with China deepened, identity started to consolidate. And increasingly, there was more of a sense of a Taiwanese way of life. And this is something that so many people said to me in my interview. So I interviewed several hundred people. And the interviews are really fascinating because they will, they, uh, most people don't want to talk about identity at first. They want to talk about economic policy, which is what I was studying. But after three, four hours of talking, they'll step back and say, wait a minute. It's because I'm Taiwanese that I'm telling you this, that I'm voting for this policy of restricting investment in China. And it takes a long time for, uh, for the Taiwanese to, after um, the 1990s, to, uh, to come to terms with what they mean by that. And uh, CEOs such as Morris Chang of TSMC, uh, Earl Ho of Tongho Steel, and student leaders during the Sunflower Movement all said to me the same thing, which is uh, being a Taiwanese means embracing a certain way of life, embracing democracy, freedom of speech, press and assembly. But now what has happened in Hong Kong and Taiwan, is there's a lot of joint studies that look at what young people think are important values. Because when you have these polls, it's really a loaded question. You say, what is important to you? And you could list a few values. So now they have open polls. They go on the street and they say, um, uh, uh, Bill, would you put on a sheet of paper your five most important values that, that you think uh, you embrace? And um, young people have put uh, on this sheet of paper terms that older generations simply never care that much about, including international recognition, environmental sustainability, uh, and um, keeping the economy open, but under the premise of Taiwan first, creating jobs for Taiwan, making Taiwan more competitive. And this is um, the framework of my, the data in my, um, in my book. The data is focused on four different episodes where the president of Taiwan uh, initiated a change um, in orientation. In 1996, Li Tonghui visited Cornell in 95 and um, led to a um, uh, missile crisis that led to him uh, proposing no haste, be patient. Let's stop all investments in China of a certain amount. And it made it very difficult for um, even his best friend, Wai Si Wang, to invest in China. And so until Wai Si Wang died, uh, they never spoke again, which is, of course, uh, very sad. But uh, this is something that actually was received overwhelming support. And the reason was because a lot of people thought that if you were Taiwanese, you should support no haste and reduce dependence on a country that could attack um, Taiwan militarily. In 2001, uh, Chen Shui-bian, um, counterintuitively, who was actually being assisted by Tsai Ing-wen, who was the head of the Mainland Affairs Council, decided to open up the economy to China. They decided to implement active opening and effective management uh, and call together conference, and this was the format that Li Tonghui started, calling together a conference to get people from different parties, different organizations, to come discuss and create a consensus. But of course, um, the opening was unsuccessful ultimately because um, uh, a large community, as I said, of Taiwanese felt that to be Taiwanese, we have to stop the most important investments from going to China, and that to them meant semiconductor. And so semiconductor is a very important case study in the book because it, it galvanized the support of high school teachers, housewives, and students, uh, many of whom I interviewed who had never been to a fab and didn't know anything about a semiconductor. But they said we absolutely have to stop semiconductor uh, policy from opening up. And this is because their sense of identity was really the most important criteria for their supporting um, a certain kind of economic policy. But by 2006 and 2008, this all changed. So as you saw in the previous graph, 2006 was when the turning point started. A majority of the people thought they were Taiwanese. By 2009, more than a majority thought they were only Taiwanese. And it's now been 2009 to now, seven years, uh, consistently so, over 60%. Um, and so when the fact that identity can no longer be a differentiating issue between political parties or political candidates, the issue of identity fell away. And in the discussion toward 2006 and 2008, change in economic policy, 2006 was becoming more restrictive because Chen Shui-bian was under a lot of personal um, scandal. And so to save his job, he thought he should appeal to the base and restrict investment with China and propose 2006. And the discussion of um, why people were opposed to it was very much focused on economic logic and the reasons why it was not wise. Um, and so uh, Chen Shui-bian was not very able to effectively tighten um, uh, uh, economic relations with China more. And then in 2008, similarly, Ma ying um, came back in May 2008 and immediately started uh, a string of uh, bilateral negotiation 
unlike the previous three episodes where it was unilaterally Taiwan opening up or restricting uh, 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 economic policy toward China. In 2008, it was a bilateral, a set of bilateral agreements, um, and by the fifth meeting between uh, the two sides, they had son signed this uh, economic cooperation framework agreement. And while it was very much controversial during the two years they were promoting it from 2008 to 2010, by the time that it was approved in 2010, over 70% of the Taiwanese supported it and thought it was good for the country. And so this was a very big change. And the discussions were very much focused on, as I said, uh, was much more moderate, less emotional. Um, and the uh, basis, of course, of my framework is that um, without a sense of national identity, it's impossible to talk about national interest, and it's even more difficult to formulate consistent economic policy. Because at first, most Taiwanese thought they were Chinese. Therefore, opening up to China must be good for us, because it's good for China, it's good for us. We're all Chinese. And as this started to change and identity was contested, um, uh, much of this uh, had to be reconsidered. And I don't deny that international environment and Taiwan's uh, political and economic environment, which Steve has alluded to, is very important. And so in the book, uh, there's a lot of information about how each of these episodes basically uh, started with an identity debate and there were external threat um, or uh, economic crises that led to a different sense of prioritization of interest. Um, after the missile crisis, everyone wanted to, to make sure Taiwan was secure. But then by 2010, people wanted to see more growth, more equity, Taiwan was becoming more and more unequal, more stability and more security. And um, uh, you can see that the policy that results, of course, has zigzagged. And now in its fifth stage, the President Tsai Ing-wen today is proposing the go new go south policy, which is again, moving away from prosper again. Um, the conclusion of my book is that when identity is contested, there is an emotional debate over extreme economic policies, like in the first two episodes in 1996 and 2001. As identity consolidates, extreme policy options become eliminated and the nature of the debate becomes more rational, just like in 2010. Um, but a consensus is still elusive because there's trade-off between growth, equity, security, um, and this requires the um, entire community to be engaged in reaching a consensus. And this is still the case uh, right now. Um, identity, of course, even though it has uh, moved away from being a factor in deciding economic policy, it has come back, um, much as it has in other countries too. Um, and it's uh, what I call salience here. So the salience of identity has returned because if that threat to that consolidated sense of identity increases, then the debate can become emotional again and focus on identity as well as on economic factors. So um, here I just want to point out that the ending, of course, of the saga is the Sunflower Movement. Um, so um, in 2010, the EGFA was signed between Taiwan and China and uh, there was so much expectation that this would bring about um, widely distributed benefits to all of the Taiwanese and this would change uh, the tense relationship for eight years under the Chen Shui-bian government with China. However, um, what has happened of course in Taiwan is also economically there was uh, increasing inequality. And in 2014, as part of the follow-on to the ECFA, uh, Taiwan had signed, Mindjo had signed in 2013 the service trade agreement. And in 2014 March, um, uh, Mainja was trying to uh, basically get it ratified in the parliament. And this uh, triggered a student protest that, um, oh, uh, the pictures don't, um, oh, is it? There were three pictures in here. Is it not? Okay. Um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't show on this one. So there's the three different pictures I was going to show that shows the sunflower movement. The students were, um, uh, they occupied the parliament and basically they sat there for 21 days and they uh, didn't go to school and the universities had to shut down. And I tell my students at University of Virginia, this is um, to say that you will go on the street and not have a bathroom and not be able to shower for three weeks to protest against the TPP or the NAFTA. Would you do that? <laughs> And all the students look at me and say, no. Um, but why would they do this? Well, they feel very strongly about this. And this is the picture of the third, um, uh, the third uh, um, 
the, the, the first weekend of the three weeks. Um, basically, in the first few days, there were polls after polls showing that people were upset about the students taking over the parliament. It was against the rule, it was against rule of law, and the students seemed to be violent. Uh, but over time, um, the uh, Taiwanese uh, society became, it started to embrace the students, and uh, the university friends of ours, um, professors started to go on the street to lecture. Instead of just shutting down, they started to go and offer courses on the street. And uh, by the first weekend, parents, um, young professionals, all sorts of organizations came together in this uh, half a million uh, people protest that was all over the island. Um, and this is just a picture of that in Taiwan. Now, Taiwan's China dilemma today is what I had just described. Um, should Taiwan lean more, lean in, or try to be more secure um, by being more uh, less dependent? And should it manage cross-strait relations by avoiding the 92 consensus uh, or by reaffirming it? Now, I want to come to a, um, uh, a slightly different viewpoint uh, that I also briefly mentioned in the book, which is all of this is important because of uh, Beijing's Taiwan dilemma. And Beijing actually has a bigger dilemma than Taiwan has. Um, and that is, of course, um, Taiwan's national identity seems to uh, be consolidating at a rapid pace. And fewer and fewer Taiwanese want unification, even under the most favorable conditions. So you'll say China has so much resources at their disposal. Why don't they do something? Well, they are. But it has very, um, it has sub-ideal options. The first option it has is um, hoping that deeper economic integration and more frequent political dialogue will restore a Chinese identity and interest in unification. So you can see this is 1993, the Guang talk, uh, when uh, Steve and I were still both in the private sector. I was actually doing the Singapore Telecom IPO at the time <laughs> in Singapore, and I went to the hotel where they were doing this handshake. and. In 1993, I can only say that so much expectation was, surely this will be resolved in my lifetime, I thought. So, you know, there's, this is, uh, uh, much of uh, the concerns are unnecessary. And they shook hands, uh, and uh, all the year before, the negotiation leading to the meeting is what formed the 1992 consensus. But of course, we know between this and this, very little happened. Um, and this is 2008, at the beginning of the Jiang Chen talk, when they started to negotiate the bilateral um, uh, trade agreements. Uh, in 2008 until 2010, five rounds of negotiations <coughs> were held. Um, and the third picture, of course, is uh, Xi Jinping, the Shima meeting or the Ma Xi meeting, depends on which side you're on, um, uh, in 2015, which was, of course, like yesterday's meeting between the chairwoman Hong Xiuju and Xi Jinping, is much less heralded. Uh, people are less sanguine about these uh, formalities and what it could produce. And the reason, of course, is the other side of the story, this is to stay the course, the other side of the story is China has um, ramped up its uh, uh, hard um, policy uh, to use diplomatic and economic sanctions and even military actions unless Taiwan recommits to unification. Um, this picture you should see is uh, uh, missiles aimed at Taiwan, which are increasing, um, but there's no accurate estimate. And this picture is covered by the picture at the below, but basically this is a picture that was shown on CCTV, the official um, uh, television station in China, national television. Uh, for every day, because um, I watch CCTV every day at noon, so I know, it was showing every day before the Taiwanese presidential election in January. And what is this? This is a PLA simulation attacking the Taiwanese presidential palace. So um, hard pressure, the threat of military um, action and this is a young singer who was uh, a winner at a reality a k-pop show in uh, Seoul and uh, um, a day before the presidential election uh, the Chinese um, uh, there is a group of people called the Umao uh, some of you may, may know netizens who basically engage in online chat uh, in support of certain government uh, propaganda and are um, uh, paid for uh, doing such service. So the, 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 these Wu Mao decided to attack her and said that this was completely unacceptable and she had so many hit um, that basically she was fired. This is right before the presidential election. And studies have shown that this has indirectly led to a much higher uh, voter turnout among young people uh, to vote for Tsai Ing-wen who won in a landslide the next day. And finally, this is the International um, Civil Organi uh, Aviation Organization which had invited Taiwan to his triannual meeting three years ago, but this year after Taiwan's election, 
uh, to step up the pressure, um, uh, Taiwan was not um, allowed to participate. And this is a picture in Montreal. So the third option, which I think is the best option, but uh, Beijing seems to be hesitant about how to do it or whether to do it, is to undertake reforms that reduce the differences between the political systems. You can see the first picture is village elections, and we know that um, after Xi Jinping came to power, uh, there's uh, actually less, um, uh, less uh, uh, fewer elections than in the past, um, and so this is not something that has been promising. And the other picture is, of course, of an AIDS organization, and uh, as you may know, Taiwan has one of the most vibrant civil society, and China had for some time also proposed that they had a vibrant civil society, but this is also uh, uh, slowed, um, slowed down in the last three years. So um, the second part of this talk is I want to talk about the implication of the book. And the implication is, um, uh, as Steve and I were discussing earlier, that basically uh, this Taiwan reflects broader trends in the world. This is a picture of uh, me in Budapest. I uh, broke my bag, a bag like, and I had to buy a new one. I bought this new one from him. But when I got to the stall in the central market in, in, the central market in Budapest, uh, there were all these flags I didn't know, and Harry and I teach international relations, so we felt very embarrassed. We couldn't name any of the flags. <laughs> so we stood there and thought we should wait for the owner to come back and ask him, because also the first flag is Taiwan, the only one I recognize, and what are the other flags? The man runs back, and he's wearing a jacket, and does anyone recognize this flag? No. It's Catalonia. And I oh. said, oh, are you, are you a Catalan? He says, no, I'm a Transylvanian. <laughs> As you know, that's where Dracula is from, and that's his flag. So I said, what is my flag doing on your stall? He goes to the back and takes out this gigantic flag and says, you hold it, I hold mine, and we're going to take a picture for Facebook. I said, no, not allowed, no Facebook for me, but um, would you please tell me what are these other flags? He says, well, I'm from Transylvania, and there are two million people living in Transylvania under the Romanian rule. We're very unhappy, uh, and I didn't want my kids to grow up that way, so I brought them to Budu Budapest so I can <laughs> raise them as real Transylvanians. And I said, wow, that's uh, uh, it's really, a, you know, you have a great sense of identity. He says, these are all European communities, nations, that would like to see more autonomy. And that's what those flags are. Um, and so there's the Basque country, there's uh, the Catalonia flag, um, and many others there. Now, what other broader friends, uh, trends Sorry, there, there are supposed to be five pictures, so I'm just going to uh, go through them. Um, so the, the broader trend that Taiwan reflects uh, is really related to globalization. So the, the first picture uh, is actually Wall, Occupy Wall Street, which we know so well about because, uh, uh, because of rising inequality. There is a real um, resentment toward the haves versus the have-nots. Uh, and then um, the second picture I wanted to show you was um, a protest in Puerto del Sol in Madrid in 2015, Labor Day, um, because it also resembles Taiwan, in that the day of uh, the protest in 2015 is probably worse now. Uh, Madrid had 47% youth unemployment versus 24% for adults. In Taiwan, that's uh, a, a similar ratio. Taiwan's youth unemployment is 12%, and regular average unemployment is only 6%. So Taiwanese young people are also more and more angry at the older generation, at the establishment. And the third picture uh, here that I was going to show um, is the umbrella movement. So uh, several months after the Taiwan uh, sunflower movement, the Hong Kong students decided they will take charge too. So they started a protest um, and uh, they took umbrellas with them um, uh, to signify their resistance. Um, and uh, uh, that, that was very much focused on uh, it was young people, uh, I think, who are um, both motivated by economic uh, inequality as well mm -hmm. as uh, the desire, more importantly, for democracy um, and for the ability to nominate uh, Hong Kong's chief executive. So the fourth picture actually is Brexit. You have Farage standing there saying, no more EU, um, and the wave of immigrants in the background of his poster. Um, I think that uh, very much so, Taiwan is also under the threat of immigration. Uh, they think that if you, for example, the, uh, the teacher union leaders I, I interview all said, if we let Chinese teachers come teach Chinese in Taiwan, where would all of us be? Um, uh, the, all the jobs would be taken. So you have the middle class, the middle lower class, the unskilled workers, the young people all coming 
uh, to, to into this uh, debate about economic policy. And um, the last picture, of course, we know is protectionism under Trump has had millions of people supporting it. In fact, I asked my students, I teach a fourth year class at University of Virginia and asked them this week um, how many was going to vote for Trump and how many was going to vote for Hillary Clinton. And the Trump supporters were very brave and s stood up and spoke about why they supported his economic policy. I was really impressed uh, by the articulation. And I think this is a question for all of us, why? Well, I think the backlash against globalization, of course, is important. Globalization is a fact, but it involves many choices. Uh, interdependence with China does not mean uh, uh, just liberalizing um, uh, extensively without uh, making choices. And there's a high level of dissatisfaction with the establishment and the rise of a separate identity among young people. Now these trends produce extreme preferences when that sense of identity is threatened. So we see that for Brexit, Trump, sunflower movement. <coughs> But severe problems from economic integration have really affected countries in the high income class. And this is how Taiwan is similar to other countries. Uh, there's increasing inequality. Taiwan, um, in the last 30 years, the top 1% has gained steadily, while the other 99% has stagnated. And more importantly, household income between the top 20% and the bottom 20% now is at six times, uh, whereas it used to be about four times before um, uh, interdependence with China deepened. Um, slower growth and stagnant real wages, especially for younger people and unskilled workers. And more importantly, people are simply not having babies. Taiwan in 2011 had the lowest fertility in the world. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it was 0.7, and uh, um, even Japan and Hong Kong exceeded one at that time. So you can imagine the difficulty because also Taiwan has limited immigration. And this places a burden on the younger people to support the older people uh, with an aging population. And of course, uh, what is important in this country is with the Fed uh, continuing to not raise interest rate. Uh, there has been uh, asset inflation around the world. Rising housing prices means most young people in Taiwan cannot afford housing, so they delay marriage, they delay having children. Um, and finally, this has led to a sense of generational injustice, which is now a very important phrase in Taiwanese electoral politics. Older generations have better jobs, more secure um, retirement systems, and simply more affordable housing than the young. But something quite different in Taiwan than the rest of the world is that they blame it all on China. Young people believe that China presents mixed opportunities, unevenly distributed benefits, and severe challenges to autonomy and identity. And this is especially so when they, many people, many of the young people, um, that I interviewed perceived that the KMT government in the last eight years deepened integration with China to benefit their own interest groups, to benefit certain businesses, and there were several business scandals like cooking oil scandal where one of the largest Taiwanese businesses that moved to China became a billionaire, came back to Taiwan and bought a cooking oil company, and uh, overnight cooking oil in Taiwan was tainted. Um, and uh, uh, everyone blamed it on uh, importing bad moral, uh, morals from China. Now, most of the young people are not really anti-China. They don't wake up thinking, are, am I Chinese, am I Taiwanese? That simply is not their, not kind of their framework. They're skeptical about indiscriminate socioeconomic or political integration with China. They're simply waiting to see. And they have immediate concerns that are economically driven. Inequality, uh, they want to live in a clean place, uh, they want to live in a nuclear-free zone, um, and these perhaps could be addressed by effective public policy if the Taiwanese government invests in public policy studies. But the concerns are also beyond material among young people in Taiwan. They include fundamental value differences with China that are very difficult to bridge from Beijing's point of view. Democracy, freedom of speech, social justice, and increasingly international recognition and respect. And I saw this last year when I went to Milan. I, I was passing by Milan, I went to the World Fair, of course, I didn't realize that although Taiwan went to the World Fair when I was in Shanghai, it was not allowed to go to Milan. So we went through the food um, stalls and realized there was no Taiwan. But on my way to the airport, actually next to the Duomo, we found that there was a pavilion. And the pavilion was funded by young people who basically used crowdfunding and got two million NT dollars, and most of them gave all of their own savings to this little stall where they rented a very expensive place next to the Duomo and put up uh, how Taiwanese actually catered 
weddings, and they put up their own pavilion. Um, and this is something that I said to the young students, you have so little money, and you want to put money in, in, a, in a place in Milan. And actually, when I spoke at Brookings, one of the organizers was in the audience. And he came up and, and told me all about it. I was very uh, moved, because I hadn't spoken to the leaders. I just simply visited the pavilion. Um, but I think having being respected is important. And this comes back to another point is that the younger generation is very different than the older generation in that unlike the older generation, they have all been to China. Since they were born, they were able to go. And so it is through more interaction that they've come to realize that they're a little bit different. And this is perhaps what I talk about the other, because when they come to the United States to study, or when they go to Shanghai to study, they may say that they're Chinese. But only when they go somewhere else do they realize, no, people say I'm from Taiwan. I can't be Chinese because there are real Chinese there. And I am Taiwanese, whether I like it or not. So identification is a two-way street where you have to identify yourself as such and somebody else has to also agree that you are such. And I think this, this sense of um, wanting a, a, to protect their identity was reflected in the 2014 Sunflower Movement against liberalizing the service industry with China uh, because in the agreement, uh, uh, beauty salon, funeral parlor, uh, these are all sort of small, medium businesses in, Ta in Taiwan were going to be open for Chinese investment. And a lot of young people thought they would either lose jobs or the small, medium businesses in Taiwan would simply lose um, their market share and lose their business. And young people, um, finally, are participating more actively in politics, but they do not espouse the existing parties. Whether it is the blue or the green, uh, young people simply are not interested. So they formed their own party uh, in Taiwan uh, in 19, in, uh, uh, this year's uh, uh, election in the parliament, they were able to get um, six uh, people uh, into, uh, five people into the parliament by a new party that used very little money um, and for, uh, for five of the 113 uh, very precious uh, parliamentary positions. And similarly in Hong Kong, um, in uh, September at the Legislative Council election, six uh, um, uh, uh, localists, as they call it, young localists were elected also um, into LegCo, uh, in also uh, with new parties. Now, um, th as this was happening, Japan also just elected its first women mayor, who was also not from either uh, any of the existing large parties, because her party uh, decided not to back her, but to back another woman. So I think these are trends that are similar to everywhere around the world, where there's a high level of mistrust against the elite. Elite like you and me, people who have cars, have graduate degrees. Um, so, um, on that note, I welcome uh, your questions. That was terrific. That really was very, very informative. I mean, the, the and you talked about the, the Sunflower Movement and the Cross Strait Services Agreement. If you took national identity out of the of the question. Doesn't the cross strait services agreement make sense for Taiwan? If you look at Taiwan overall, the, the, the entire population, isn't it a win for Taiwan, given the sophisticated services that exist on Taiwan versus the less sophisticated services in the mainland, and that it's going to be a job creator? Uh, well, I, I uh I think, Steve, the problem is much more uh, complicated than that, and that is because the, it's impossible to extricate national identity from any of these discussions. You can do an economic analysis, which right. doesn't well, take the, into account national right. identity. But that's, the, that's, that's the economic analysis that we do here uh, is very much related to the intention of Chinese investments in Taiwan. So this is the perception. I, I would say it's perception because the cross-strait trade agreement simply hasn't been ratified. The students were very successful in stopping the ratification, and it's now being postponed um, for a uh, framework that would allow uh, Taiwanese people to participate in all discussions about cross-strait policy. And so this is what the students were successful in. But I think what's very important is that, that both the students and a large part of Taiwan society uh, believe that China has ulterior motive um, in, uh, in its, uh, and the, the economic players from China are not pure economic players. If they were state-owned enterprises, or even if they were private enterprises, if they buy up all of the beauty parlors, 
um, how, uh, how could that be something that's positive for Taiwan? And so I think it's um, to extricate identity uh, is impossible because it is an economic issue, um, if you will. So as uh, I think most people would agree, um, all things political are uh, economic and all things economic are political in China. Um, so to say that they are two separate um, uh, uh, areas is, is simply uh, cannot be accepted by voters in Taiwan. But can the elite do an out? In other words, th there are, when you analyze trade agreements, you can make an analysis as to job creation effects, the job losses, who's a beneficiary. Forget the, the perceptions. The problem that exists today in America is the perceptions, and it's true in Taiwan, the perceptions become the reality. And I think it's incumbent upon us to speak out as to what the actual effects of these are. Well, actually, you know, when the EFA was proposed, a uh, massive amount of economic analysis was produced. And unfortunately, EFA did not produce those, um, did not meet those expectations. So I would say that, yes, uh, there are a lot of economists who are employed to do this to help the government uh, propose and ratify these agreements. Unfortunately, for many reasons, uh, those things have actually, um, uh, those expectations have not been met. And therefore, um, uh, newer analysis are simply met with uh, uh, skepticism. And I think that part of it, of course, is the economic slowdown in the world, uh, Europe, uh, the economic financial crisis uh, in Europe has spread and also China slowed down China's internal reform uh, to, uh, to lower its leverage and, and a change from export to domestic consumption. All of these things affect Taiwan deeply. But I think that the bigger issue was um, the Mayanjo government was trying so hard to use cross-strait economic policy as the solution to all problems. And that simply cannot be the only solution. It has to be met with better governance. And I think that's also um, uh, the advice I would give to the current government. You've worked with more state-owned enterprises than <laughs> many people, in, than vir virtually anybody I know. Should we suspect their motives when they invest in Taiwan? Should we suspect their motives when they invest in the United States? I think rather than suspecting their motives, suspecting their motives means there's a norm. But I think the norm in China is simply state-owned enterprises are not just there to produce for enhance shareholders' value. This is the first thing I learned on Wall Street. We're here to enhance shareholders' value. I thought to myself, really? How come I've never heard of that before? <laughs> and then, of course, it took me years to realize in Europe they don't think so, in Asia definitely not. So I don't think suspect is the right word because that would be disparaging. And I think that, in fact, in this oh, way... Ulterior motive is what you said. I yes. Think. Well, I think in this way, ulterior motive is relative to what Americans expect, that companies are there to enhance shareholders' value. And I think that state-owned enterprises, uh, and in all my, and as, as Steve knows, I've done so many uh, privatization deals of, you know, basically selling hospitals, selling schools for state-owned enterprises so that they can go public on the New York Stock Exchange. Though that whole exercise, a large part of it is basically you're cutting out jobs and you're cutting out the dependence on a larger entity for financing. And that's a, a, it's a very destabilizing social uh, policy when you um, privatize. And so I think that uh, you know, Taiwan having, of course, moved into a market economy and a, a fully democratic um, country uh, is grappling with how to cope with uh, uh, China, that uh, the Chinese companies, if you look at Hong Kong and China, so in 2000 and, um, three, Hong Kong went through SARS. So China proposed that they would have SIPA to save Hong Kong from the disaster. And it worked. Overnight, tourists rose and businesses grew. Uh, I still currently sit on a Hong Kong um, uh, hospitality board. So I see the hotel business number every week and I'm very concerned about it. And I know what policy does actually for the, for the economy. But the, um, the big issue, though, is over the years, this has also not produced the same effect in Hong Kong. The same trends are happening in Hong Kong the last three years. The younger the Hong Kongner is, the more they identify with being a Hong Kongner and not even partially Chinese, which is astounding because Hong Kong people, so many of them are first generation from China. They're not, there's no, no separation as in Taiwan and, and China. So wh what, is the, what is the issue with all of this economic um, 
benefit. I think uh, in the case of uh, SEPA, what you will see is a, it was very destabilizing for companies. Basically, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange overnight, the top companies were all red. They were all mainly Chinese companies. And, and, um, and the other side of it, of course, is that fewer and fewer small businesses were able to grow. Uh, in Hong Kong. And so today, today, Hong Kong's inequality is far worse than Taiwan. And I think this is an issue that must be addressed um, for us to have peace across the street. Let me um, open the, the floor to questions. Um, did you have a question right here? No? Then Bill? Yeah. Um, Bill Einbrecht, a retired journalist. Uh, and I lived in Taiwan back in the mid-70s, and I met Harry and Steve back then. Uh, my question is, what about a grade school then? What do you mean? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, what about uh, the children, grandchildren, and even great grandchildren of the mainlanders, the Waishan run? Because the youngest of them who actually moved over from China would be in their late 60s by now. So it's, you know, they might have the identity still of the older ones as Chinese, but their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, I presume, would be much more inclined to see themselves as Taiwanese. Or yes, it's a very good question as to whether the ethnic divide still exists. So the important part of the uh, identification chart I show you is, you are correct, Bill, is that a large number of people born in China have died. They just are, they, they have to be over 80 to be even possibly be born in China. And so, um, and studies have shown both in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, now numerous studies have shown, that your birthplace makes a big difference to your ethnic identity. So for Hong Kong, which never had an ethnic divide until the last, I would say, the term started only five years ago, um, that you know we're a Hong Kongner, we're not Chinese. This is something that was, when I was studying Taiwan, I didn't really think it had anything to do with Hong Kong. And living in Hong Kong for 25 years, this is now the big focus. But why is that? Well, the studies show that if you were born in China and you come to Hong Kong, um, that you're more likely to still consider yourself partially Chinese, even if you're not only Chinese. You're partially, uh, you're both Chinese and Hong Kongner. In Taiwan, this is the case. But then if you look at the numbers, and I quote the number in my book, of course, there's so few people born in China. So what about those children and those grandchildren? Um, well, the children and the grandchildren, of course, are more inclined to identify themselves in the dual category, both Chinese and Chinese and Taiwanese. But the younger they are, the less impact it has. Also, because there's a lot of mixed marriages. Uh, there's no, quote, pure mainlanders. Most people are mixed of some way. And mainlander status was given on your ID card if your father was. And so if your mother was Taiwanese and your father was Chinese, your ID card says you're a mainlander. And so you know, it, it doesn't say mainlander. It says you're from Shanghai or it says you're from Shandong province. So uh, this is all gone. And so um, the lack of an ethnic divide officially, as well as among the younger generation, is what propels this trend, absolutely. Besides the economic factor, Thank you for coming. Besides the economic factor, can you touch it in the political structure? Would it be between China and Taiwan have some sort of a change and a smooth unification of the two sides? Well, my my entire study is about what what is possible, and I actually. Um, I thought this might be a question people might ask. So uh, in my book, I talk about four possible scenarios. Uh, but much of the scenario, the reason I study Taiwan, of course, is there's a lot of data. And also, of the three sides that are quite important to this trilemma, I call it Washington, Beijing, and Taipei, the one actor that has changed the most is Taiwan. While Beijing and Washington have held the same official position, more or less, uh, for the last 35 years, uh, but Taiwan has has um, really changed a lot. And this is not something Beijing uh, would like to see in terms of the way it's going. So the possible, of course, pos the possibilities, I think, are um, uh, there's a large part of it that's dependent on Beijing um, and also uh, the Taiwanese government, how they uh, govern. 
But I think Taiwanese identity, as I said before, to not be pessimistic. In 1989, if 52% of the people can say they're Chinese, in 30 years, they can change to say they're all Taiwanese. In 30 years, surely they can change back to say they're partially Chinese. So this is what one must think about in terms of the longer framework of history. But is that difficult? Yes, it's increasingly difficult um, because uh, to reincorporate Chinese identity by the Taiwanese as presently defined by Beijing is very difficult. Most of us have what I call multiple identities. I'm a mother, I'm a political economist, uh, I'm an investor, I'm a woman. But all of these things cannot be de denied to me. But if you say I have to choose, then it's very difficult to say, oh, what, what must, I, must I be this and not that? And this is the situation that Taiwanese are forced to uh, now contend with. They can only be Taiwanese or Chinese. They have to love China or not love China. But it doesn't have to be that way. It should be that everyone should be proud to be Shanghainese and Chinese, Taiwanese and Chinese. But this was, I think, the big expectation early on when the two sides started interacting with each other. Um, but China, of course, can also democratize and propose a new Chinese identity based on common values and institutions. This would be more along the line of federation, um, a federal system. Um, and the third possibility is that, Chinese ide that China's identity and political agenda change. So unification is no longer a core goal. And I think this is very unlikely. In fact, I teach primarily mainly Chinese students uh, in, the fall, in the spring in Hong Kong at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And in the fall, I teach primarily uh, American students, primarily Virginian students mm -hmm. at University of Virginia. And I find it really interesting because I always teach the same course in both places. But the most interesting thing is the mainland Chinese students, however liberal they are about everything in the world, and they want democracy for themselves, they want freedom, they want the right to, to assemble, but when it comes to Taiwan, it is a separate category, they say. <laughs> it cannot be discussed in the same way. They cannot have a separate identity. Um, and I find this is so interesting that the young people across the strait are becoming more and more different and uh, both more nationalistic, if you will. Some call it populist. I don't think that's the right word. Populist, you know, it, it gives you a sense that, that a large part of it is irrational. But I think this is all very rational. Um, and um, so I think that to make it not a core interest anymore in China does not seem likely, especially if you look at the young people's tendency to be actually even more uh, patriotic in China. And finally is that Taiwanese continues to consolidate a separate identity, and unfortunately Beijing may feel that it must use force. Um, I think the fourth option is too costly for Beijing because it has now many core interests. Taiwan used to be a top interest. Now Taiwan is only one of the top concerns. And so uh, it has, uh, it, uh, it means uh, there is some silver lining to that, if you will, that there is time for Taiwan to, um, uh, to try to govern better. Terry. Uh, thank you. Uh, Terry Lotz, uh, Syracuse University. Uh, Shirley, thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you can elaborate a bit more on Chinese perceptions of Taiwan, uh, because you focused on the economic relationship. But what about tourism, education, you've touched on briefly? Uh, the fact that there are, I'm not sure how many hundreds of thousands of Taiwanese living in China, are they perceived as, as Chinese, as Taiwanese, or what else? And I guess in addition to that, I'm wondering, you know, China is very diverse. Uh, and it's not so long ago in Chinese history that we, uh, you know, people in, in Guangdong or Shanghai might identify first by their locality rather than as, as Han Chinese. Uh, you know, we can accept that Tibet and Xinjiang are separate ethnically, but also different in terms of identity. So I'm just wondering, you know, in this, you know from the Chinese perspective, uh, if you could flip it around a little bit more and, and say, you know, is this as big a problem you know, from the Chinese point of view as it seems to be from the Taiwan point of view? So, so too bad I couldn't show the pictures of the, the European, European countries, countries I was talking about. <laughs> but, you know, the European Union, the European project is the best example for this, of course, um, it, because uh, Europe, after all these decades of economic integration, 
uh, was very much hoping to produce a pan-European identity. And this is something I also teach in my class, to make a comparison. And over the years, European identity um, has risen very slowly. And in fact, more than 40% of Europeans now identify themselves primarily as their national. I'm Italian. And some of them will say, I'm Italian, uh, also European. And the last category is, I'm only European. And you can imagine, the only European category is very small. <laughs> and so why is that not happening? Because uh, economics um, spilling over, politi having political spillover, uh, is very limited, especially in bad times. Um, and in good times, uh, they may temporarily um, look good. And I think that uh, China has this issue with the Chinese economy slowing down. And at the same time, they're proposing a stricter definition of Chinese identity than ever before. And in Taiwan, it's harder to see this. And my study is focused on the d domestic debate uh, on the island um, uh, toward China because it's an open debate and, and groups are very involved. And I can interview uh, people of all ranks, all professions. Um, but from China's point of view, um, it is something that I, I think about all the time because that, that's the most important factor. And from China's side, while they're trying to restrict the sense of identity to be uh, more narrow, to be patriotic, the they experiment they now uh, basically are holding is in Hong Kong. So as you know, as I said, six young uh, localists um, from this party called Young Spiration uh, if you've been to Hong Kong and listened to their campaigns, you'll be astounded. Uh, even as Taiwan has, is an emerging democracy, Hong Kong uh, really uh, has not enjoyed democracy before. And the student campaigns are um, amazingly energetic, but um, does not have the kind of policy substance, of course, that one would hope to see. But they're able to get so many votes. Because um, in Hong Kong, there's a real sense that you're either a Hong Kongner or you are patriotic. So there's actually, it's a, it's a uh, mutually exclusive category. If I'm patriotic and I am pro-establishment, uh, as what they call uh, pro-Beijing uh, political parties, uh, then I cannot um, uh, safeguard my sense of being a Hong Kongner, which means a rule of law. And this is also very interesting. In Hong Kong, the open polls show that older generation thinks the number one value in Hong Kong is rule of law. But the younger generation's number one value is democracy. <laughs> That's a very, very big divide. Um, and so the older generations are not really able to communicate with the younger one. So I think that uh, China has an issue because um, it, the economics are slowing down, and yet more and more local identity is on the rise. Uh, and that local identity may not threaten China politically, uh, but in the case of Taiwan and Hong Kong, and as you said, Xinjiang and Tibet, all of these things uh, must be something that China considers as it becomes more powerful in the region. We are unfor I know there are a lot of hands up. We are unfortunately out of time, but this has been a fabulous presentation. The book is outside for sale, and the author is here to do it, and she proves that former bankers and investors can be great <laughs> presenters with incredibly great thoughts. Thank you so much, Earl. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was terrific. Thanks. Terrific. I wasn't sure if this camera or that camera was the camera.